God spoke the word and there was light Made the sun and moon so we could sleep at night He created all things, animals and trees And don't forget, he made the manatee Manatee, manatee, swimming in the sea, it's a manatee God made it all, creatures great and creatures small he made
So the Penny Parade, the purpose of the Penny Parade, aside from seeing who's going to win, is to benefit the Bethesda House, which gives a safe and nurturing place for young mothers and their children. And right now, I think, I think Laura said they need something that keeps stuff cold, fridge, freezer, something like that. Some, it's an expense. 
and we're using the penny prey to uh, help uh, defray that cost. It is, does, they do the Lord's work. Uh, people have been members here. Uh, volunteers are in our congregation who go and volunteer at Bethesda House. So I have a question. I keep forgetting this. Who won the first night of the Penny Parade? <laughs> who won the second night of the Penny Parade? <laughs> who won the third night of the Penny Parade? <laughs> and who won the fourth night of the Penny Parade? Two to two on the fifth night, we collected the pennies. We put them in a highly secure location so no tampering could happen, Laura's office. And so now we are going to find out who is the winner of this year's Penny Parade. Can we get a little music and some dancing? <laughs> I'd like to say that was close. <laughs> All right. Thank you, sir. Wow. The girls. Man, great job, girls. Great job, everyone. Because this is going to help the, that ministry, the Bethesda House, really buy something um, that these women and children need. So thank you very much. This is the time that I get to just share just a little bit. It's not a sermon, so don't, don't settle in and say we're going to be here for 20 minutes or half an hour. That's not the case. As a matter of fact, I'm on a seven and a half minute timer. Well, first off, I want to share, say to you, thank you very much for entrusting us to love your children for a week. We had an awesome, awesome time. It was just a lot of fun, a lot of dancing. They learned a lot, and so thank you, because I know that it's very difficult with all families have going on to get the children here. So thank you for that. They learned this, morning, this whole week, they learned about history. They learned the seven C's of history. They learned that God created everything. He created everything in six days, and on the seventh day, he rested they learned about how sin came into the world with Adam and Eve. And, you know, that's really the frustrating part because a lot of people today don't understand that we are born into sin. So let me just take a few minutes to explain that. When God created Adam and Eve, they were perfect. The whole Garden of Eden was perfect. Everything about everything was perfect. There was absolutely no sin in the world at all. Nothing. Nothing. And Satan took the form of a snake, and he enticed Eve to question what God said. God said to Eve, do not eat from the tree in the middle of the garden, from the fruit in the middle of the garden, or you will surely die. Now, the confusing part is when he said you will surely die, we understand that there are several ways to die. There is physical death that we are all, we all understand physical death. When we lose a loved one and we go to the funeral, that is a physical death. But there is also a spiritual death, a spiritual death. 
And when Adam and Eve sinned, and God said that you will surely die, they died a spiritual death. And so when that happened, just to take you back just a little bit of, a little bit of the meaning of things, the word Adam, the little word Adam in the Hebrew means mankind. Mankind. So when Adam and Eve sinned, they sinned for mankind, which means that every human being born, because the Bible tells us that all of us were made in the image of God. You'll find that in Genesis chapter 3. We were made in the image of God. We were made male and female. So when he made us, we were all made and created by God. But when Adam and Eve sinned, they sinned for spiritual man. What does that mean today? That means all of us are born in sin. Every last one of us are sinners. You're, we're little sinners. You saw those beautiful children up on the stage. All of you parents and grandparents, let me ask you a question. Did you ever have to teach your child how to sin? When you were raising them and they told that first lie, or they took that first cookie, or they took a toy from their brother and sister, did you ever think to yourself, when did I teach them how to do that? You didn't. Because all of us are sinners. So when Adam and Eve sinned, they sinned for mankind. So now, what is the solution for that sin? That solution is Jesus Christ. That solution is God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whomever believeth in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now, one of the things that we get so confused about is all of the religions and the faiths of the world. If you are Baptist, if you're Catholic, if you're Presbyterian, if you're all of these different religions, all of these foreign um, Eastern religions and Buddha and all these things. Some of us, some people walk around and actually believe that they all lead to God. They don't. They don't. You see, when we were born with the hold in our heart from the sin of Adam and Eve, it was a natural inclination for us to search out a higher power. And so that's where religion was formed. That's where religion came from. Way back in the Bible, they used to worship the sun and called it the sun god Ra. They worshiped the Nile. They worshiped all the things they couldn't explain. Why? Because we were born into sin, and we have to worship something. And that hole in your heart is to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only one that can fill that hole. He's the only one. It is not about religion. When we get to heaven, the Lord, when we stand in front of the throne and God, and every one, last one of you, whether you want to believe me or not, you will stand in front of the throne of justice. You will stand in front of God. No matter what you believe right now, no matter what faith you grew up in, if you don't understand that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, and he wants you to confess your sins. He tells us, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just. He will forgive you of your sins, and he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You see, when God set up the plan for salvation, he had to send his one and only son, Jesus Christ. Jesus, when he was on this earth, 2,000 years ago, he was sinless. He did not commit a sin. Why? Because he was God's own son. He came to the earth holy. When Jesus was walking the earth, he was 100% God and 100% man at the same time. That's why in Scripture he says, I am the son of God. I am the bread of life. And so the world has us believe that God is so, you know, he's going to accept me because I've given to this charity. Or he's going to accept me because I worked in the food kitchen and fed the poor. Those are all wonderful things. Don't stop doing them. 
But that isn't the answer. God said, in order for you to be in glory with me, you must accept my son. And by accepting his son, that is what makes you a Christian. The word Christian is not a religion. Yes, some of you may want to hold your ears. There are Christians in the Catholic Church. There are Christians in the Lutheran Church. There are Christians in the Baptist Church. There are Christians in every single church that identifies Jesus Christ as the Son of God. You can be a Christian and go to these churches and learn about God. Why? Because we preach the Bible. Because the Word of God is the Bible. So don't get things twisted. Don't think that the religion that you grew up in is what's going to get you to glory. No, no, no. A relationship with Jesus Christ is going to get you to glory. And when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that is what makes you a Christian. Not the church you go to. Not Mass. Not singing in the choir. Not going to Bible study. Not participating in VBS. That doesn't make you a Christian. And just to give you a little further understanding, the word Christian literally means Christ-likeness. It means Christ-likeness. That is what a Christian is. So don't get it twisted by the churches that people go to and think that, that uh, that's why God knows I belong to this church, so I'm going to heaven. No, the church you belong to has nothing to do with you spending eternity with the Father. Now, guys, that's the truth. That is the truth in black and white. It really is. And God wants your heart. When I came to know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I grew up in a home that was kind of split. My father, my father was not really there a lot. He put us in a home. He went to work. And on Thursday, we didn't see him till the following Monday. Now, that's a fact. That's a fact. When he did come home, he was drunk. There's a lot of things going on that were not nice. That's a fact. My mother had an eighth grade education. And she taught us the Bible. And every morning, she would pray that the Lord would save us, that we would understand that we needed Jesus. That's a fact. And it wasn't until I was 28 years old that I put things together because I knew the stories of the Bible, but it wasn't until I went to a church in Holbrook chasing my now wife that I understood that there's a relationship, not a religion. And I heard the gospel. I heard from the pulpit that Jesus wants your heart. And I said, what do I have to do? And so a couple of weeks after that Sunday, on a Wednesday night, I kneeled down in my kitchen and I said, Lord, if you say who you say you are, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Help me to know you more. Now, I will tell you, when I prayed that pray, prayer, at almost 30, I didn't levitate. I didn't all of a sudden float off somewhere. But after I prayed that prayer, it was like something came off of my shoulder. And then something really wild happened. When I started reading the Bible, things started making sense. You see, the job... When we become a, become a Christian, something physically happens to you. It is called the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It enters your heart. Remember the hole in your heart I was talking about? When you accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, he fills that hole with the Holy Spirit that the Bible talks about. And when that hole is filled, when you start reading your Bible, you start understanding stuff. Let me tell you a really quick story. So my wife has been a Christian a long time, since she was 12 years old. And so when I become a Christian, 
and I'm starting to read the Bible, and I've got men teaching me the Bible one-on-one, and I learned something that blew me away. You heard it from the kids this morning, that the rainbow was created by God. The rainbow was created by God to let man know every single time you see a rainbow after a a rainstorm or after bad weather, you see a a, a rainbow across the sky. That is God literally telling you that I remember I will not destroy the earth by flood. That is in the book of Genesis. So every time you see a rainbow, I know the world has made it into a, a pot of gold at the end and all that stuff. That's not real. And so I learned that at men's Bible study, and I went home, and I was so excited. Now, my wife knew all this stuff, right? And she knows that she married a guy that's kind of really out there, if you can't tell that by now. I, I don't know what being quiet is. I don't know what being shy is. And so I ran home, and I said, Cakes. And I called my wife, Michelle, Cakes. I said, Cakes. I said, you want to know something? She said, what? I said, do you know where the rainbow comes from? And she sat there and said, yes, that's just God reminding us that he's not going to destroy the earth by flood. And I went, you knew that? You knew that and you didn't tell me? And she just stood at me and went, oh, my God. I haven't been the same. So when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, stop thinking about the way your life used to be and allow him to take it where he wants you to go. It's a slow process for many of us, okay? The, the Bible term in, semina- in, semin- in seminary is called sanctification. When you become a Christian, you become a better Christian today than you were yesterday, and a better Christian tomorrow than you were today. Bottom line, when you become a Christian, you continue to grow until you see his face. We're not done. It's not like when I'm on my grill and I'm cooking my beef ribs and I'm turning them bad boys and I'm seasoning them and I stick my fork in them and I go, oh, baby, you're done. And I take it off. Now, I married a chef, so you got to understand that when I say it's done, only the chef can tell me that it's real. And she cuts into that beef rib, and it comes out medium rare. And she looks at me, and she goes, oh, yeah, honey. And that's when you go, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. When you become a Christian, you want to grow until the day that he takes us home. It is not just, I mean, let me put it one other way. I'm going to leave you with one story. When you got married, that was your wedding day. It was the happiest day of your life. That's what, it like, that's what it's like becoming a Christian. When you become a Christian, that's your wedding day. But 30 years later, 10 years later, you're working out that marriage, are you not? Well, that's the same process as becoming a Christian. The wedding days when you say, yes, Lord, Forgive me of my sins, but it takes a lifetime to work out your salvation and working through. And your salvation is sure. You cannot lose the salvation. Let me tell you a really quick story. So this man, he became a Christian in his late 30s, 40s. He worked hard for uh, all his life. He was a laborer, just working hard. He had three children, two daughters and a son. And he got to be in his 70s, in uh, late 70s, early 80s, and he was on his dying bed at the hospital. And when he became a Christian, his wife became a Christian, and two of his girls became a Christian, but his son decided, no, I don't want that. You know, I'm unhappy where I'm at. And so there he was in the hospital, and his two daughters and his wife and his son are in the room. And one by one, his wife comes up to him and gives him a kiss, and he says to his wife, Honey, I'll see you later. His oldest daughter comes up and says, Daddy, I love you so much. And he gives her a kiss and he says, Honey, I'll see you later. His second daughter comes up and she's the, she's the, the youngest in the family and, and she's just full of emotion and she said, Oh, Daddy, I love you. And he said, Honey, I love you too. I'll see you later. His son came up and he was broken up. He's losing his father. He's emotional, and he says, Dad, 
I love you. And his father says, so long, son. So long. And so when the father passed, the son was outside with his mother and his two sisters. And he was hurt. He's like, why did dad say he'll see you later? Why did he say so long to me? And his mother said, because you didn't accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior yet. We're going to be with dad in glory, and you're not. And people, that is what's at stake here. You can go on with your life thinking that you know best, thinking that you know God and you, you worship God in your own way. When God has told us the only way to worship him is through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I praise you and I thank you for this time together. I thank you, Lord, for the children and what they learned. I ask you, Heavenly Father, as we go on just to finish our program with a lot of fun happening, I thank you, Lord, that all of it happened because of you, because of who you are and who we are in you. For those, Heavenly Father, who are pondering a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, may they seek your face this morning. May they not leave here before they ask questions of me and, and the people on the VBS team, Lord God, that we will help them know and understand to start a relationship with Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.